The following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick, and you're listening to Matt Slick Live. If you want, you can give me a call, as usual, at 877 2276. And if you want, you can also email me. You can do that by just uh, addressing it at info at karm.org. Info at karm.org. And I can check out what you've got. In fact, I'm looking there right now just to see if anybody's emailing us. And there you go. And, uh, hey, I'm just throw this out. You, know, you never know who's listening. You never know who, what the issue is. Um, who might be listening, an expert or something like that. So I get Windows 11 and uh, I've researched this. There's a green tint on some of the programs. Maybe some of you out there have spent some time on that or know what the issue is. I've researched, and I'm an ex-computer tech, so I know what this troubleshoot. Not been able to really solve that problem. Don't know if it's a video card going bad or what. But um, anyway, hey, maybe someone out there goes, oh, "I know exactly what it is," you know, and they can uh, they can help out. But if not, no big deal. All right, all right, all right. We have four open lines. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. Okay, I think what we ought to do is just jump on the call. we got one call waiting. Let's get to Rudolph from North Carolina. Rudolph, welcome. You're on the air. Yes, sir. Um, what is the difference between hail and electrifier? Well, it's a tough one. I've done studies on this, and um, I've got an article that I've written on it, the word study on a lake of fire. And uh, so I'm not exactly sure how to answer it because it looks like hell, uh, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire as then cast in outer darkness. Now, is this metaphor or is it literal? So the passage, the lake of fire, occurs, uh, let's see, five times in the New Testament. And the lake of fire which burns with brimstone and a tormented day and night uh, with uh, the lake of fire, in the lake of fire. And let's see, uh, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And uh, people are thrown in the lake of fire and their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with um, Fire and brimstone, the second death, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Okay. So when I look at that and I compare it with uh, death, Hades, the wicked, chaff, people of Sodom and Gomorrah, devil, and those who worship the beast, I find that there's uh, several categories here. I did some pretty good sense of research on this. So people are thrown into the, what is thrown into the lake of fire includes death, Hades, the devil, the false prophet. I'm hearing somebody talking in the background. So maybe one of the producers don't have their, their yeah. switch on or something. So, uh, so, and also, the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire okay. and uh, burned in the chaffer. But at any rate, so I'm not exactly. Hell is just a place of, uh, of, of okay. torment. In and it looks like hell overall is. Uh, the I think that's thrown into the lake of fire. So I'm not exactly sure. You know, it's just it's just something I'm I'm not exactly sure about because the terms are used a little bit interchangeably without specific clarity. Okay. Okay. It, it, yes, sir. Well, since the lake of fire is for the devil and his angels, and hell goes into that place, and Jesus talked about the rich man going to hell, is a hell for Humans in the lake of fire for demonic yes. spirit. And, and the people. People go in the lake of fire as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it says the wicked, the, immor uh, the immoral murderers, those not abiding in Christ, those not in the book of life, they are thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20.15 and 21.8. And uh, this is also thrown into the fiery hell, as it says, or which is Gehenna. And so hell is often translated as Gehenna. Gehenna was a place outside Jerusalem where there was a perpetual fire burning. And it just it didn't go out. And this became a symbol 
of uh, of hell. So it was a refuse dump, and because people would just continually throw stuff in there, it was always smoldering. And so there was an image of that fire that does not go out. So people, the wicked are thrown into the fiery hell, they're thrown into the lake of fire, they're thrown into the eternal fire. So all three of those are stated as uh, where people are, and that they're burned with fire. So it is a tough one. And those who are thrown into the lake of fire, okay, the wicked, the immoral, uh, are also cast into, uh, or Hades is cast there, into the lake of fire, along with death. And the devil, the beast, and the false prophet, and also uh, those who worship and receive the, the mark. So those are cast into the lake of fire, which is also uh, the people, the wicked, are thrown into the fiery hell, which is Gehenna, which is generally said translated to be hell. So you see how it's not exactly easy to uh, to exactly say which is which. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend, and God bless you, brother. You too, man. God bless. All Thank right. Bye bye. Okay, well, that was Rudolph from North Carolina. If you want to get uh, on the phone with me, all you got to do is dial 877-207-2276. We'll be, oh, no, we went right back. we got to break too, too early. Let's get to Daniel from Alabama. Daniel, welcome. You are on the air. Hello, Matt. Hi. So I was I was uh, in a group the other day in Facebook, and I saw a discussion on marriage. Uh, mm-hmm. There were... You know, it was, it was a lot of confusing answers, and I wanted to ask you, if there is a marriage ceremony between two couples, and they, they had all the ceremony, but they haven't registered the the paperwork in the court, are they considered married, or do yes. they have to go register the, the, the ceremony in, in the court for, for them to be considered married before God? Who determines yeah. that? The state does not give us authority to marry. That's something that belongs uh, to God and His privilege. So when I perform wedding ceremonies, I tell the couple, when I do premarital counseling, I say, this is what makes you married, is your vows to one another is a covenant between God, between people, and with each other. That's what constitutes marriage. The state does not authenticate that. You could be on a desert, desert island. We all three could be a desert island. I could perform a ceremony. You are married because it's a covenant promise and with covenant signed the rings and things like that. So it's wise, however, to file with the state because we want to be in submission to the government. But they do not authenticate or validate our marriage. So what happens if you are uh, doing mission work in, um, in, say, Africa, and you meet someone and you fall in love with someone and they have a, a marriage ceremony that's not your traditional ceremony, and you go through a village ceremony? And to them and to all the eyes of the culture of the people, you are married and you understand that to be the case. Well, then you're married. You come back to the States with your, your uh, bride, let's say. Oh, suddenly you're not married because it didn't register with the state? No, that's not how it works. But we should uh, register because that's just what we should do because that's uh, some of the requirements. But I tell the people, that's not what gets you married. It's your vows. And I even tell them, I go, we go over the marriage ceremony. And I tell them, once you've committed to each other, you're already married. And then what I do in the ceremony is, is uh, I then say, now I, I, you know, at, at the end of the ceremony, I'll say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. And uh, that doesn't make them married. It's the presentation of them already having been married through that ceremony. All right? Okay. Okay. So, so that means that a couple... Do they need a third party for them to get married, or can they just say the vows by themselves and they should uh, and, and accept? They should have a third party because it's a covenant, and a covenant a covenant is between people and between God. So it's a three-way covenant. So the couple now, if they're in a desert island. Okay, I mean, and that, then they do the vows there. I, oh, okay, it's good enough, okay? <laughs> They're in a desert island by themselves, all right? And that's all they got. But normally speaking, you have witnesses, and this is how it is. With marriages in the Bible, they have a cultural context and people gather. And so the marriage is a union as well as a separation. It's a union between a man and a woman, and it's a separation from that man and the woman from culture. 
and what that, that separation entails is that no one else has the right inside of that marriage bond to certain marriage privileges uh, the privilege of seeing each other in the buff and relations and things like this and so that's an exclusion of those outside that covenant bound and it's an, and it's an inclusion within the, those two people who are making the covenant and usually customarily there is a uh, an officiate someone who performs that ceremony that guides the ceremony and, and it's not mandatory that it happens but that's just the normal way it's done and so though I'm searching in my mind while I'm talking about how it's done in the Bible different cultures have different marriage ceremonies and they're valid because the people are committing themselves to each other but they're also done publicly normally they're done publicly because the community needs to witness their bond and that's an important aspect of the marriage which is why you'll have the tradition of anyone uh, you know sees a reason why they should not be married let them hold their, their peace uh, you know speak now or forever hold their peace uh, is is part of that issue of the covenant bond before the society and so normally you want to have that a public ceremony and uh, okay. with it, and with an officiate is just the best way and it is it just makes sense that way and that way the couple uh you know it's just tra tra more tradition but could they do it just themselves you know i don't like to encourage people just to say it themselves and that's it uh, but i don't see anything in scripture that necessitates uh, a third party officiating so i'm just saying i just don't see it but it's best to do it as a public ceremony as an official system usually as an official uh, member or, or somebody who's performing the ceremony uh, and with the community present it really is that whole communication and covenant aspect that demonstrates the necessity and truth of that marriage bond okay okay thank you Matt hope that helps hope it helps yeah okay all right all right then okay we got anything else that'll be it no. It'll be it. All right. Well, good. Well, God bless that. All right, man. God bless Thanks. Daniel. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I perform many uh, marriage ceremonies, and uh, uh, so it's nice to do, you know, and and uh, funerals and things like that. Uh, I, I don't like doing them, and the reason I don't, <laughs> I can explain why, is because they're really important, and I don't want to mess up. And so I really feel like the pressure's on. Say it right, don't mess up, because it, it's, a, it's a super important thing for people, you know. And so I'm a little intimidated by getting up and, okay, say this right, do this right, and, and stuff like that. Um, but that's okay, you know, and people understand when things don't go right. And sometimes they don't. That's what happens in marriage. Sometimes things just don't go as nicely as you would like them to. Um, and and that's okay. You know, just praise God for for the problems, for the issues, the differences, and things like that. All right, all right, all right. Well, we have nobody waiting. Let me see if I can do some hate mail because it's a lovely Friday, and I love doing hate mail. It, hate mail cheers me up. And there's the break. Perfect timing. Maybe we'll come back and we'll get this hate mail. If you have a comment or a question uh, for the radio show, you can email me, info at karm.org. And if you want to give me a call, all you got to do is dial 877 Two zero seven two two seven six. Be right back. It's Matt Slick live, taking your calls at eight seven seven two zero seven two two seven six. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the show. We're about twenty minutes after the hour. And if you want to give me a call, eight seven seven two zero seven. 2276. Let's get to Mike from North Carolina. Hey, Mike, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. This is the first time caller. All right. Good. Uh, oh, good. I have a question. I love your show. Okay. Uh, good. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this couple, and I've known them a long time. They're good Christian people. Um, but they had recently, they've both been married at least twice. And I want to know if it's biblical uh, that now they both say they have went back and they now are preachers. Okay, wait a minute. So, wait, they're both preachers? 
yeah, now they stand there. They they are officially preachers now. The man and the woman. Biblical. And the man and the woman. Yeah. Right. In as in churches or yes, preachers in churches or pastors. Uh no, but yes, she is. Okay. But he's just a minister in the church, but she is the uh, senior pastor. Yeah, that's very unbiblical. She is in violation of the Word of God. Okay. Okay. That's the way I was taught myself. Well, the issue is, what is the Bible? Where where can you... Okay. Where can you find that scripture to to back that up? I'm not... not, uh, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I don't know where to, exactly where to tell them or show them. Okay, I'll, I'll show you where it is. But also, you can go to my website and you look up the article, uh, Should Women Be Pastors and Elders? And you'll find all the documentation right there. But I'll go over it right now also. So this is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. But before I read that, actually, I'm going to go to 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, because it's important. He says this, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of truth. So he's writing to Timothy so that people will know how to behave in the household of God. Okay? This is what he says to to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 12 and 13. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. So God, through Paul, is saying, nope. A woman is not to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now the word quiet, in Greek there, is hesukia. And it means, okay, oh, yawn. okay. it means to keep, uh, keep it down. It doesn't mean you're absolutely silent. Uh, because you can become even more quiet, more hesukia. The word for absolute silence is sagao, and that's not there. So it's like saying, but to remain even more quiet about this issue, just keep it down, okay? Uh, for And he ties it in with, yes, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. So it's not a cultural thing. It's related to the uh, the cross of Christ. Um, excuse me, it's related, related to the Adamic uh, order of creation. Furthermore, it says, uh, in, as he goes on in 1 Timothy 3, is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, that's the Greek word uh, episkopos, which they get the word bishop, it is a fine work he must desire. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. So he's got to be right. a husband of one wife, all right? Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, Okay. So, this is what it says in 1 Timothy. Now, when we go to Titus, Titus chapter 1, he says in verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe. So, the elder and the, the episcopos, or the bishop, are interchangeably used they are to have uh, to be uh, it says in Greek uh, anermias gunaikas or anjemias gunaikas a man or a husband of one wife a woman cannot fit that bill and finally when you go to 1 Timothy 5.17 it says the elders who rule well are worthy of are to be considered worthy of double honor especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching the word elders in the Greek there is presbuteroi which is the masculine plural nominative in the Greek, which means it is the masculine uh, case, or masculine uh, 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 gender in how the words are arranged in Greek. And it's not feminine. There's a word for the feminine form, form, it's not used. And there's a neuter form, and it's not used. It's the masculine, masculine plural, elders. So the preacher, by definition, is an elder. Elders are to be husband of one wife, men who do this, men who do that. She is uh, in rebellion against the word of God. She ought not be a pastor. And if I was in that church, I would politely put point this out to her. 
and then I would uh, warn her about the violation of the Word of God that she's under and that she needs to submit to God's Word and then she would say uh, no thank you not listening that's just uh, not, that's just your opinion and then she will rebel against the Word of God and that's what uh, is, it happens I've never heard of a single woman pastor once they've I've I've taught them and others have taught them what the word says I've never heard of even a single woman pastor saying you are correct that's what the word of God says I'm gonna step down not a single one they always defend their position and they dismiss the word of God because of their, their pride their arrogance or stubbornness okay that's what I've seen okay. thank you so much sir I love right. your show thank you well praise God man thanks for calling all right all right, let's get on the air here with Mario from North Carolina. Mario, welcome. You're on the air, buddy. Thank you. Hey, Matt, how are you, sir? Oh, I'm tired. Just one of those days, you know? Yeah. You know, just one of those days. Yeah. That's well, okay. The weekend, yeah. But the weekend's coming, and I only have uh, a bunch of work to do this evening and tomorrow. And that takes Sundays off. That's one day we could get off. So, hey, people ask. Come and tell them. Yeah. So, what do you got, buddy? Hopefully you get some rest. <laughs> yeah, I do a little bit. Yeah. All right. So, um, I have a question. Um, I, I'm trying to uh, get clarification of on the sequence of the tribulation period, mm -hmm. uh, specifically around the 144,000 Jews. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the sequence is, uh, beginning with the rapture of the church. And where the uh, 144,000 Jews will come into play, and uh, where the Great Tribulation would start. Could, can you help me out on that? Uh, well, what I, what I can do is give you generic positions that different people have given, and then I'll tell you what I affirm. Okay. And what I affirm may not be right. So you always need to check what Reverend Slick uh, on the radio says. You got to check my guy with scripture, okay? So I get to see you, you okay. know, going to somebody. Well, I talked to a guy who says this. You know, who's that? Oh, a guy named Slick on the radio. You know, it just doesn't sound good. So you got to check <laughs> it out. All right. So the 144,000 are supposed to be from the 12 tribes of Israel. This is spoken of in Revelation 17. Or Revelation uh, 7, not 17. And uh, we got a break right now. So hold on. We'll be right back after the break, and we'll continue with this, okay? Hey, folks, two open lines, 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. Let's get back on the air with Mario. Hey, Mario, you still there? Yes, sir, I'm still here. All right. So, from what I understand, the predominant view in America, which I don't agree with, incidentally, is what's called the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I hope it's true. I really do. I just don't believe it is, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And so, the, uh, from what I understand, at the beginning of this time, at the beginning of the tribulation, they will say the rapture occurs. During the tribulation period, 144,000 male virgin Jews will then preach and teach before the miraculous signs during that time. And then uh, the Antichrist will be, re be revealed halfway through. And then at the end of the seven year tribulation, Jesus returns. I got to sneeze. Hold on. Wow. Sorry about that. And then uh, before Jesus comes back, uh, the Antichrist will be let loose and uh, there'll be a war and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Jesus comes back and then the, uh, there's a thousand year reign of Christ. And during that period of time, uh, things are really good until that bit, and then some say that's when Satan's let loose is after the end of that thousand years some say he's bound before there's, there's quite a bit of variations so I believe my opinion is just my opinion is that we Christians go through the tribulation period we're not going to escape it and it's going to get bad and uh, we'll see the Antichrist who he is and um, many Christians will be beheaded for their faith suffer uh, and flee to the hills and things like this uh, there'll be starvation and camps and put in and things like this and uh, during that period of time 
the 144,000 male virgin Jews will be awakened by the Lord and they will uh, preach mightily uh, either in Jerusalem or it's going to be in Israel or all over the world which I think is going to be all over the world 144,000 for this period of time and uh, many will be killed for their faith and then uh, at the end of that seven year period the new heavens and new earth are made Christ comes back and I believe this is my opinion too that the first ones taken are the wicked not the good and I can show that from scripture too a lot of people are surprised when I show it to them they go that's what it says but at any rate so there are a lot of views and uh, you need to take what I say with a grain of salt and check it out you know but so that, there you go okay well I really right. appreciate that yeah it's, uh, it's very uh, complex right uh, but I just yeah. want to get uh, your opinion on this uh, I really appreciate very much what you do and hope uh, you get some rest and God bless you bless you and your family and your ministry yeah, well, thank you very much. You know, God's gracious, and uh, at, even at 66, I still have a sharp mind, and I can still do stuff, and I'm, I'm just thankful for the Lord to allow me to continue uh, well past the age of retirement. So, you know, by God's grace, He gets all the glory. So praise God. Keep listening, yes, all right? Sir. All right. God bless, man. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Bye. All right. All right, let's jump over to Simon from Norway. Hey, Simon, welcome. You're on the air. Hello, are you there? Hello, don't I click on the button? We'll give them a chance. Sometimes they have connections, problems from over there. Uh, so we'll give it a shot because you might be on hold. Well, it could be expensive. I don't know if he's calling that way or how it's going to work. So, what we'll do is we'll put him on hold and then go over to William from North Carolina. Will, you're on the air. Yes, sir. Hey, okay. So, what do you got? Are we on? You're on. You're on the air, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Real quick, real quick, and you probably got a real quick, uh, easy answer for this. Oh, what I don't is know. the difference? <laughs> okay. What is the difference in, in, in an agreement or a contract and, uh, uh, shoot, cat's got my tongue now. Between uh, what? Like covenant and dispensationalism? Gifts. Covenant, 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 yes. Okay. Covenant. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. So okay. between that and what? You, you said you want me to con contrast, compare between covenant and what? Or just explain what and covenant an is? And, and just a, a contract or an agreement. Oh, you want to know what, a co what covenant is? Yeah, okay. the difference in, in a lot of people just say, well, covenant is just an agreement. Or a contract, but I think it, it, it goes deeper than that, in my opinion. Well, biblically speaking, okay, I got some dogs barking, so I'm going to mute you, okay? Oh, well, we'll get the dogs. Yeah, I'm trying to get in the house, too. That's oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. I'll come. I get them on, on mute. Uh, so uh, we'll get back to them in a second. But so a covenant is a pact or an agreement between two or more parties. And the biblical covenant has uh, stipulations with rewards and punishments for keeping or breaking the covenant requirements. And the covenant has a covenant sign, biblically. Marriage has a covenant sign of the ring. Communion is a covenant sign. Circumcision is a covenant sign. And so the proper methodology in the Bible when you make a covenant with God is there's a sign associated with it. So that's what that is. And uh, that's just what it is. And it is a, a contract. And there's different kinds of covenants. You can have a unilateral covenant where God makes it with Israel and it's independent of what Israel does. And so God is the initiator, the unilateral uh, head of it, and it can never be broken. Then you have a mutual covenant, like a marriage covenant, till death do us part. So my wife and I are married until one of us dies. The first one who dies, then the other is no longer married, just that fast. And so that's a covenant that's uh, uh, with two parties and certain conditions. And so when the conditions are fulfilled, the covenant is too. So there, we have variations in covenants and stuff like that. So I don't know, you're back on the air. So what do you think of that? Did that help? That helped a lot. All right, good. <laughs> In fact, get this. In fact, get this. The word in Latin for covenant is testamentum. Old Testament, New Testament. Testamentum. What does that mean? Oh, it means covenant. That's, word for it. that's okay. Latin for okay. covenant. Yeah. And so God works covenantally. 
And now there are people who are dispensationalists, and you know, and, and okay, that's within orthodoxy. I don't affirm dispensationalism that God works differently in different dispensations. I don't do that. I just say no, He works covenantally because it's based on His character, His essence, the nature of His speech, His word, which reflects who He is, and He covenanted with us and has covenant signs all over the place, and etc. In fact, get this. A lot of people do not know this, but the Ten Commandments, you've seen the pictures all over the place. Moses has got the Ten Commandments. And it'll be like, you know, you'll see one, two, three, four on one, and then five through ten on the other, or five and five. What? That's wrong. It's just not how it works. The covenant, there are two copies of the covenant. It's ten and ten. And the reason there's two tablets is because each party gets a copy of the contract. Of the covenant that's how it works if I write a contract with you I don't just keep the copy there's one copy it's me I, I get it you don't get a copy that doesn't make any sense and so you get a copy as well we don't split it down the middle half for you and half for me each person gets the full copy right. so right. The, the two co the two documents the Ten Commandments uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it but uh, there was they both were in the Ark of the Covenant the Ark of the Covenant was considered the mercy seat on top was the, the footstool of God. So it's in the presence right. of God. And the other copy symbolizes the being in the presence of man, owned by men, by people. So the double covenant copy signifies the covenant between God and man, and it's put in the holy place. It's really serious. Furthermore, the uh, pattern of the Ten Commandments is what's called the, the uh, suzerain vassal treaty a pattern of the third millennium BC the suzerain vassal a suzerain is a big king and a vassal is a small king and how the pattern worked of that time in that culture way back then was to the big king would initiate a covenant with the lesser king and they'd say this is who I am this is what I've done and here's the conditions that if you break it, you, you know, this is a problem. If I break it, there's a problem. But if you keep it, then, etc. So notice what the Ten Commandments is. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. So he's saying, this is who I am and this is what I've done. You shall have no other gods. Don't make any idols. Uh, for I, if you do this, then the punishment comes. The iniquity visited upon the fathers and the children. And showing loving kindness to those who keep the commandments. So there's, it's a pattern that was, uh, that was unearthed by uh, Meredith Klein. And he discovered this, and so the Ten Commandments are a pattern of after this ancient suzerain vassal treaty pattern in the third millennium BC in the Middle East. And each party got a copy of the covenant document, so it's ten and ten. That's how it works. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. So. Hey, there you go. The next question is: Is how mm -hmm. can I get a copy of what you just said? <laughs> well, if you, if you send a hundred dollar bill with a paperclip note okay. to it, um, or what you can do is just uh, just just go to YouTube and just download the, this show and you can watch it, and it's there. Okay, it's not a big deal. Okay. All right, or look, go to the website Carm and look up uh, Ten Commandments Covenant. See if I've written an article on it. I think I have. All right, buddy. Sure. All right, man. Okay. All right, Cub. All right. God bless, man. Hey, folks. Look, we're about Quartel. So if you want to give me a call, 877 207 2276. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877 207 2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Let's get on the air with Simon from Norway. I don't know if he's still there or not. I don't think he is, though. Okay. But he did text me, and, uh, oh, I heard a click. I don't know if I just clicked it off right before he got on, but he sent an email, and a uh, question on the radio show for now. Why do modern Bible translations omit verses from the New Testament? Uh, well, the reason is, is because they've, they've worked with older manuscripts. Generally what happens with the manuscripts, they're first written, and uh, imagine this. Uh, John writes an, uh, an epistle, and, see, first John. And he writes this, and it's perfect. It's inspired. Well, that document needs to be copied. So the copyist will go through letter by letter, not word by word, but letter by letter, and copy and be very, 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 very careful. It does happen occasionally when people are copying that they're tired. 
and they will they, they're focusing and they just it happens people get tired they're sitting there they, they don't have as much food as we do good lighting as we do the temperatures are colder in rooms and things like that and fatigue can take them and they can actually miss a letter like the word ha what is a single o which is the word the and it's possible to miss or a rough breathing mark over it or something like that so let's just say that uh, someone misses the word ha which is just a single stroke a single circle and then what then he goes he says well we can't use this as an official document but we don't want to get rid of it because it was costly uh, to produce documents time consuming so then he might make a note in the margin uh, ha uh, and make a note to ha uh, before uh, it should be ha anthropos you know like the man and make a note on the side right there and so then he'll go on and finish the manuscript and that manuscript will be used for teaching like in what our equivalent might be Sunday school where a it might be in a class it's not to be preached out of necessarily but it's a worthy document a, a copy but it's got a little bit of an error and it's a side note now let's say they use that one document for teaching and they know this for 100 to 200 years and let's say there's a war someplace and or a plague and everybody in, the, in there is wiped out the document is sitting there and sometimes what people do they would put them in in uh, clay pots because that's how they would preserve them but what if they put them in a clay pot and then uh, everybody dies off or whatever happens and then 200 years later someone comes in and there and does some rummaging around and finds a clay pot and finds that manuscript they don't know necessarily what's going on is that ha the definite article of the word the is it really supposed to be in the original or not and so they might continue to admit it but they have that manuscript copy or they might say it does belong in there but then you have this copy with a slight variation so as time goes on more of these kinds of variants can creep in so you can get fifth sixth, sixth seventh eighth century documents that were copied and so generally speaking with this kind of knowledge you can understand that the old the newer the manuscript the more potential for an error to creep in now we got to understand I'm not saying that this happens all the time but you have to understand that uh, I think all the manuscripts put together like they're like 99.85 percent textually identical that these little copies things like this that happened are exceedingly rare here's another thing that could happen is instead of the ha being omitted by a, a scribe who's copying it what if the parchment it gets old and that single little letter flakes off because the the paper is just getting old because the parchment was different than our paper and little segments could do that well then what do you do then you compare them so this is the kind of thing so as time would go on there's more time for at uh, least these variants to creep in so the further you go back in time the presumption is the more accurate to the original it is and this is why you will see hold on a sec I had to cough this is why you will see uh, Bible translations that are more modern omit verses and certain comments and certain things out of uh, the Bible, the New Testament. That, and the reason is because, like for example, the King James will be translated with fifth, sixth, seventh century documents, where the NSB might be second, third, and fourth century documents, and so it's considered to be more accurate. Uh, and you might have a few variations and there, some are significant like the ending of Mark and then the Kamo Jehanium and the woman caught in adultery in John 8 so these are the ones that are significant that we need to look at and this is why the, uh, the newer translations don't include some of the stuff from the older translations because uh, some of the scribes would put notes in and uh, make comments and start try and add or correct uh, something that they thought might be a copyist error because sometimes some things in the Greek I'm not sure they understand it and you might get a scribe who thinks he knows Greek and he's trying to make it better because he's heard this is what his tradition has said that could cause a problem so there's variations and and, and things and then sometimes what would happen is you get an original document and uh, they'd be written in what's called a codex like a page instead of a scroll and you actually might have uh, an instance where the scribe might uh, go from left to right and then when he goes back to the beginning of the next line he actually skips a line and starts to copy 
And that might mean that, that a couple, three words were missed on this one line. And could, the fatigue can happen. So real people really did this. And though the method was very particular and they were very, very careful about copying, sometimes these variants would occur. And they would keep these copies. And sometimes through history, people would find these later copies and go, what do we do with these? Are they originals? Are they copy the original? What's going on? And so, like I said, the more manuscripts we find, not we, but the scientists or the archaeologists find, and they compare, they find that the older ones don't have some of the things that the newer ones do. So therefore, they say they're, it's more original. Okay? And some people say, well, this means that uh, you're, you're corrupting the Bible. On the contrary. On the contrary. Uh, it's not a corruption. It's a, a purification. And then so we can get into some more stuff about that. But there you go. I hope that answers that question, okay? If someone says these verses seem to take away crucial spiritual tools and central gospel truths, such as Matthew 18.11, which is also missing. Yes, let me go to Matthew 18.11. Uh, and I have it in the SB. Let's see. It says for this, yeah, it says uh, it's in brackets, and there's a note there. Uh, early manuscripts do not contain this verse. Uh, well, okay, it doesn't contain early manuscripts. Don't later ones do. Let's see, why is it there? It might be that someone wrote in a particular manuscript, uh, wrote that in the margin as a reminder to himself, or something else that was put in with it or next next to it, and therefore it was included in later copies of that manuscript. This is why it's not as ex exactly easy to say. So when it's in brackets, I won't preach on it. I won't, I won't use it as actual scripture. I'll just skip it. I might say, uh, this verse is inserted here, manuscript evidence differentiation. If you have it in your Bible, we can talk about that. After church, come up to me, I'll tell you about this. Or I might just, just take five minutes and address it right there in the sermon so people under, understand. So there you go. Hope that helps. All right. All right, all right. Let's see. Let's see. Here's a. Oh, I'm gonna do some hate mail. Okay, I'm gonna do some hate mail because I need some hate mail. Hate mail cheers me up. Uh, uh, so let's try this one. Uh, oh, I like that one. I read that one already. And let's try this one. You said, my friend, you confuse me. No, I do not confuse you. You. <laughs> See, I love this stuff, you see. If someone says something and I'm confused because of what they said, and then, you know, like, well, you're confusing me. You know, no, I'm not confusing you. You're confused. <laughs> so they can't even admit that maybe, just maybe, they're not speaking as clearly and coherently as they need to be. Um, that's possible, you know. And uh, maybe it is also possible that I'm just not getting it. You know, that's certainly true. Anyway, do uh, No, I do not confuse you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not confuse you or have been confused by pastors who taught you that Satan was in heaven when he was never in heaven, throne of God, the heaven you read in Revelation 12, which you have quoted, not in the King James, which is another error you are doing not reading the Bible in King James Version, that heaven is a firmament. <laughs> wow. It just, man, I don't know what it is, man. I, I just enjoy it. I just enjoy hate mail and stuff like this. Because these people, they're not making sense. You know, they, they don't make sense. These statements are just with assumptions and not understanding with the issues. I wish they'd reread them a couple of times. Let's see. It goes on. Thief, which he misspells thief, is Satan. Murder is Satan. Dragon is Satan. Uh, Satan is devil. Father of all lies. Uh, it doesn't say murder is Satan. That's not what it says. Uh, anyway, all this was never in heaven. Oh, man, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, before the devil fell, he was in heaven with the Lord. And when pride was lifted up, then he fell. He was cast out. He said, did you not read what Jesus said to, when he said, thieves cannot approach heaven? So, <laughs> so Satan's a thief, so he can't go to heaven. Where did it say thieves cannot approach heaven? You know, people will say this stuff. I'll talk to people online, and they'll say that thieves cannot approach heaven. I'll say, can you show me the verse for that? Well, it's there. You know it's there. I go, no, don't tell me what I know. I'm asking you because I don't believe that's in the Bible. Where is it? Don't tell me that. You know it's there. They read my mind, you know. They're like, I'm telling you what you think. It's like, give me a break. 
Anyway, she says, Satan is a murderer, and murderers are never permitted in heaven. Oh, man. Uh, God, who said that in Revelation has never changed, he has been the same, and his word has never changed. If he said that, he has forever said that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, oh, look what he says. He quotes it. I saw Satan fall from lightning, uh, like lightning from heaven. So he just quoted where Jesus Jesus said he, that he fell from heaven. That's where he was at. And yet he, he said earlier that Satan was never in heaven. You know, so much heresy, so little time. All right. Uh, so before you confuse your self-study heavens, heaven, and all heavens sin, the Bible, you will stop coming to hasty conclusions. Oh, man. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. I don't know about you guys, but I like that stuff. Let me try another one. Let's see what we got here. Hello from Minneapolis. I had a thought yesterday that I was... Okay, here we go. I had thought yesterday that I was normal. I wasn't. I eventually found out very early this morning that I had become an MPD. A petite, brown-haired, white female was with the altar. This had also had happened this past year, or August of this year. I do believe that the time of the last days before the seven-year tribulation period here in Minneapolis uh, is required to be in witchcraft. <laughs> Whoa. Oh. Okay. I didn't know that was in Minneapolis. When I was there, I wasn't required to be in in uh, in witchcraft. You know, I can see you getting out the plane at the airport. Are you in witchcraft? No, you're required to be in witchcraft. I am? <laughs> Where'd you get that? It's right there over the concourse. It's witchcraft there. Okay, so uh, let's see. The blue collar side. Oh, yeah, I already got that. Uh, in the summer of uh, this one particular year, a construction company was constructing a high-story building near the downtown area. All of the construction workers were in an altered state of consciousness while working. That's awesome. See, I love that because it's so ridiculous. You see, it gets me excited. My voice goes up. I get excited with 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 uh, stupidity. I'm sorry, but that's what it is. So with all the workers on this one building were in an altered state of consciousness while they're working. Now, first of all, I want to say, well, is that safe? They're in an altered state of consciousness. What does that mean? Are they safe up on a, an I-beam walking and they fall? You know, and how does he know this? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You see, folks, there is delight in being a Christian apologist. You can have a lot of fun. Hey, there's the music. May, uh, may the Lord bless you. Have a great weekend, everyone. And by his grace, we're back on the air on Monday. And by his grace, we'll talk to you then. God bless everybody. We'll see you. Bye. Another program powered by the Truth Network.